musical truth. But I didn't find any books on the market that dealt with hip hop from a spiritual, occult, metaphysical aspect. It's very hard to find uh, someone who played a prominent role in one of the bands who does not come from a career military type family. The Beatles, you know, the album Sgt. Pepper was intended to announce the death of Paul. You've got a grave there. Musical Truth is the groundbreaking new book from DJ turned author Mark Devlin, available now at Amazon or from musicaltruthbook.com. Go on, do me in your bastard cowards. We don't want to live anyway. Not in a stinking water like this. Oh? And what's so stinking about it? Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Mr. Grady, you were the caretaker here. I'm sorry to differ with you, sir. But you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. So when it comes to critically minded truth seekers, it seems they've always got a favorite scientist, which is Nikola Tesla. And their favorite US president is always John F. Kennedy. And their favorite filmmaker always tends to be Stanley Kubrick. And this is totally understandable, given that the guy's uh, canon of work was totally enigmatic and totally captivating. And there seems to be so much hiding beneath the surface narrative of all of Kubrick's movies. Great truths encoded into uh, the fabric of all his films. I've long been fascinated by this guy's work and I've always understood that there's so much more to know in terms of what he was communicating uh, through his work. And so I've wanted for some time to do a volume looking into the work of Stanley Kubrick. It was merely a case of finding the correct guest to uh, talk to and I think I've found him. We're on the line today to author and researcher Carl James. Hey Carl. Hi, how you doing? Thanks very much for having me on the show. Good man, good to have you along. And uh, I saw you online a few months ago on a panel on Richard D. Hall's Rich Planet TV yeah. show. That's how I came across you. Right. And I think you were talking Kubrick related stuff there. Oh, and I was, so, yes. uh, yeah, I made a note to reach out to you. <laughs> and I'm happy we could do this today. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, we've got a whole bunch of things to discuss. But okay. first of all, maybe you just want to start by explaining what it was that got you yourself fascinated with the works of Kubrick. What got you on this path? Um, I've had a lifelong interest in um, Hollywood films, um, and I've always loved his films, like most people do, you know. it's Like you say, there's something very, very special about his films, very different from uh, your standard sort of uh, Hollywood filmmaker. And, uh, yeah, I, I got the impression that there was something... When you watch those films, you always get the feeling that there's something going on under the surface. The, the, your experience is something a bit different. Um, and I don't think I really ever got it uh, when I was younger, but certainly in the last sort of 10 or 15 years when I've been doing a lot, sort of, particularly after 9-11 really, but started doing a lot of alternative research and that. And um, still having an interest at that point then in Hollywood films and directors and writers and that, and seeing sort of the paths that these people... Uh, crossed with um, people in the establishment, elite figures, people who work for certain parts of the global agenda and stuff like that. Right. And, you, and you're thinking, well, they, they can't be sort of mutually exclusive. There, there has to be some sort of influence from one, again, one to the other sort of thing. So right. um, I think it sort of added up really with Kubrick because it just sort of, you could see that well, what, what you see in alternative research, what, we're, what people like you and I sort of see going on in the world, you can certainly see it, not necessarily outright, but certainly in the point of um, allegory and metaphor, that sort of thing. It, sure. It's there in the films, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and his films seem to be drenched in all Absolutely, that stuff. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, how much do we know about Kubrick himself in terms of where he came from, his social background, maybe mm. his genealogy, his ancestry? Uh, I think it's, it's on public record that he was Jewish or yeah, uh, yeah. Is, is said to have been Jewish. Yeah. Uh, but there's also evidence to suggest that he himself sort of moved on the edges of elite society, if not mm. entirely within it. So how much do we know about uh, 
you know, his background, where he came from? Well, I've, I have looked into his sort of ancestry, and um, like you say, it's a public record, so you can find out a fair bit about his uh, genealogy. There doesn't seem to be anything particularly outstanding. It's, um, like you say, his Jewish family, sizably originated in Austria, I think. Mostly small traders and business people, that sort of thing. But what I found particularly interesting about him is that when his parents moved to America in the uh, early 20th century, um, he was in this sort of quite a, a, um, a large sort of Jewish uh, environment in New York. But the fa family generally brought the children up as sort of non-religious environment. Um, and I do wonder whether that says something about his attitude towards certainly what the Jews allegedly went through during the Second World War. Um, there's a there's a good book actually called um, The Wolf at the Door, Stanley Kubrick History and the Holocaust by Jeffrey Cox. And that documents quite a bit about his um, genealogy and sort of that, that upbringing. But like I say, yeah, he's, he had some very, very strange attitudes towards the Nazi era of the Second World War. He collected a lot of Nazi memorabilia. Uh, he considered making several films set during the sort of Nazi World War II period. His third and final wife, Christiane, was the niece of Veit Harlan, who was the... Uh, famous writer and director of uh, Nazi propaganda for uh, Joseph Goebbels. And it's claimed that there are allusions and subtext relating to his interest in that period in his film. I don't, I'm not sure how convincing uh, some of the cited examples are, such as the shining. Of, some people say it's a discourse on the Holocaust, that sort of thing, but I would say that there was probably uh, stronger themes coming through in that film. Right. Um, but certainly there are a few oddities if you look at his films. I mean, I can give you one good example that I know off the top of my head. Um, in 2001 A Space Odyssey, there's a scene early in the film where the ape man throws the bone. I'm assuming you're familiar with the film, yeah. But, oh, uh, absolutely. I've seen yeah, it about yeah, 20 yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One but of my all-time scene... favourites. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing film. It really is. Yeah. It really is, yeah. But you've got this scene where the ape man throws the bone into the air and you have this transition over across sort of millions of years and you know several hundred thousand years at least, you know. Sure. And you see this orbiting satellite, which originally, according to Arthur C. Clarke, when they were writing the, he and... Uh, Kubrick write the screenplay there were going to be hundreds of these orbiting nuclear weapons platforms um, around the earth and for whatever reason they decided to change that and they showed just the one which sort of the transition between the bone and that but what's interesting is that on the satellite is a post-World War II German flag which begs the question really of why of all the nations that Kubrick could have represented on, a, on an orbital satellite whether it be the American flag or Russian flag British flag or whatever you know so, so that's interesting. Uh, and also the fact that on the design work on the satellite, there's some sort of similar to Masonic Knights of Malta, Knights Templar motif, which, of course, were used as the, the Prussian-German Iron Cross design as well. So, hmm. um, so you, you see that theme coming through. And I do wonder what that, you know, there's, there's a lot of speculation about why that is, but uh, he certainly yeah. took an interest in that. So. Well, very interesting, yeah. Mm, mm. And um, he certainly seems to have suggested an inside knowledge of how mm, elite yeah. groups operate. And there's yeah. a few clues in some of the characters in his movies, some of the central characters. Yeah. And I, I've noted uh, Tom Cruise's doctor in Eyes mm. Wide Shut is kind of trying to get in these elite circles, but he's yeah. being kept outside of it. And then you've got Jack Nicholson in The Shining. And as you said, that movie is just full of allegory mm. and there's so many interpretations you can put on it. But just on the surface narrative, the caretaker of the Overlook Hotel is trying to kind of impress his bosses and, you know, get in the club, so to speak. Yeah. And then you've got Ryan O'Neill with his pretensions towards aristocracy mm. in Barry Lyndon. And I'm wondering if these are kind of semi-autobiographical characters which represent yeah. Kubrick kind of wanting to be more a part of these inner elite circles but mm. still being on the outside of it. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, do, I do think so, yeah, definitely. I think it is reflective of his life and I think it's reflective of the, the, the acquaintances he had. I mean, I, I, hopefully I can get through them quite briefly here actually to show you to just a few examples. But sure. um, there are a number of people that and I can talk about just sort of establishment types first of all. Um, certainly during 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, he consulted and befriended people like Jeremy Bernstein who worked at Los Alamos and Brookhaven Laboratories. He worked on the Project Orion which was investigating nuclear pulse propulsion for space travel. Freeman Dyson who worked for British Military Intelligence. Um, he was a fellow of, of the Royal Society as well. Frederick Durant who was part of the CIA convened UFO debunking Robertson panel. Uh, there was Irving John Good who was a codebreaker at the notorious Bletchley Park. Worked for GCHQ as well. 
he was an IBM consultant and uh, allegedly originated the transhumanist term, the technological singularity as well. So, um, Interesting. Was, yeah, yeah. Marvin Lee Minsky as well, was co-founder co of uh, MIT's Artificial Intelligence Labs. Uh, B.F. Skinner as well, this is an interesting one, who worked on behavioral conditioning, uh, who famously once wrote that children be reared by the state to be trained from birth to demonstrate only desirable characteristics and behavior. Uh, con connections with the Tavistock Institute and apparently headed up a department, a university department that was used by the CIA under MK Ultra as well. Um, Margaret Mead was another person he was close with, a cultural anthropologist, another stalwart of the Tavistock Institute. Uh, she was the founding mem one of the founding members of the World Federation of Mental Health. Uh, the president was John Rawlings Rees, who was Tavistock Institute, uh, British Psychological Warfare Bureau as well. And her husband, Gregory Bateson, was part of the MK Ultra project. Um, Wasn't he the then, founder of the OSS as well? He was as well. Yes, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, he was part of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and of course uh, Bertrand Russell as well was another close friend of his, uh, who was a proponent of um, Tavistock methodology, uh, the teaching of the Frankfurt School, and rec retrogressive psychology, that sort of thing. So, well, dubious um, company kept. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's Arthur C. Clarke as well, you know, high level NASA and JPL uh, figure, once the head of the uh, Commonwealth of Nations Atomic Energy uh, Agency, which was. Um, uh, one of his associates was Mark Oliphant, who uh, worked on the Trinity team on the Manhattan Project as well. So um, he, he, he was responsible for bringing NASA, IBM and Bell Labs, those sorts of people, on to 2001. I mean, I will talk a bit more about Clock uh, a bit later, but uh, sure. yeah. Um, and he was courted, like we say, going into sort of the, the, the more sort of elite circles, you know, he was courted for... Uh, to be uh, uh, involved with the 1965 uh, White House Festival of the Arts. Uh, there was a secret memo, presidential memo, discussing how he was one of the most influential filmmakers and they were desperate to get him involved. Uh, um, apparently, it seems as though he wasn't, but um, what's interesting about that memo is that it was classified for a number of years alongside documentation showing NASA's involvement with 2001's production as well. It's, uh, mm. it's been around for a while now, but it was classified for a number of years. And um, I'm just trying to think of so Yeah, I mean, certainly... Uh, Carol Quigley, who um, wrote about the Anglo-American establishment, um, there is this contention that Kubrick was loosely aligned with those people. So you're talking about Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, um, proponents of Cecil Rhodes, the Morgans, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, that sort well, of thing. So, they're all there. Yeah, yeah. And one other notable example, before I get off that, sorry, uh, is that um, he was seemingly acquainted with the Italian Aldobrandini family, noble family. And... Um, allegedly Eyes Wide Shut was based on some of his experiences at the family's villa in Italy, Fraschetti, I think it was in Italy. And how true that is, I'm not sure, but allegedly there is a signed portrait of Kubrick in the main hall of the villa with a note thanking the family for their support uh, of his filmmaking. And of course the, that family is uh, distant cousins of the Breakspears family, they're married into the Rothschild family, mm -hmm. and anybody who's researched this subject will know that they are um, either linked or direct bloodlines within what the, the so-called black nobility. So, uh, and of yeah. course, um, Mentmore Towers, which was used in Eyes Wide Shut as well for the exterior shots of that, was was owned by the Rothschild family as well. So you know, wow, yeah, so it's uh, crazy that, <laughs> really when you look at it. That's more than enough connections to <laughs> raise some eyebrows for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I want to get into some specifics about some of these movies, particularly mm. two thousand and one. I've got a, a few questions that just cropped up about that. So mm. let's dive into that shortly. Just before we get into the specific movies, uh, I mean, people are probably familiar with this concept of placing the truth in plain sight that the elites seem to feel the need to do. You know, this is where we get things like predictive programming, but we also get elements of things that are really going on in the world, which seem to be encoded into movies and other works of popular culture to give us the opportunity to know. And I talk about this a lot in my public presentations and stuff, and it's in my book. And for me, it's all about... Uh, tacit approval and unspoken consent you know those are the concepts yeah. that are at play here so when it comes to hollywood movies you often find that some great truths about things that really happen in the world are put into these ostensibly works of fiction mm. but when you learn to read between the lines and spot the symbolism and stuff you can actually understand what it is that's being communicated yeah. quite blatantly and there seems to have been a lot of that in stanley's movies mm. and i'm just wondering if you feel a lot of this was in there because he was playing his part in this whole process on behalf of his paymasters, you know, those that control Hollywood. Or 
being such an auteur as he was, uh, was there an element of him being a bit of a rebel and kind of going off script and wanting to communicate these things himself, do you think? I know that's a bit of a complex question, but yeah. what would be your view on that? I suspect that he was probably caught between two worlds, I think, actually, because he was, I mean, there's no denying the fact, if, if you're in that world, if you're doing what you're doing, you are a Hollywood imagineer, for want of a better way of putting it, you know, a magician type of thing, you know, you, you are... Um, it's expected of you to sort of convey these messages and, you know, to get the tacit approval, like you're saying that. But on saying that, though, um, there does seem to be this rebelliousness, like you say, that's coming through with him. And I would say that certainly in the early part of his career, he was going along with the system a lot. But I think probably around about, I, I would say it was Spartacus probably that did it because he had such a right. bad experience on that film that he sort of... Um, didn't really, uh, yeah, it's difficult to, I mean, he, uh, he moved to England after, around about Lolita, right. and you can certainly see um, the film sort of post Lolita, there is that rebelliousness there. If you watch the films now, you get the feeling that he was doing a lot more, he was pushing against the accepted Hollywood rule book. Yeah. Um, of course, he was still being financed by Hollywood, but I think that disconnect from America being in the UK gave him a lot more um, independence and... Um, but, you know, there are these things, I mean, you look at um, reflectiveness between him and what he was experiencing. Um, I mean, certainly, if you look at Eyes Wide Shut, we were saying before about these characters in these films, he, he seems like he is almost an outsider, he's part of the system, but he is almost an outsider, and he's reflecting that in these films as well, with a lot of these characters, the isolation as well, you know, with mm. Dave Bowman in 2001, and um, uh, Jack Torrance, you know, when he's trying to get his writing done, all this kind of things. Being, you know, can, can I just um, can I just jump in there and ask yeah. whether you think uh, Stanley was frustrated because he wanted to be a part of these inner circles, and maybe he started communicating some of this stuff in his movies out of exasperation that he wasn't being let in, or do you think mm. it was an element of him looking on at the, the sort of things that these elites get up to uh, yeah. with a disapproving eye, mm. and maybe? you know, not being too happy about it and, mm. you know, trying to communicate it in that way. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult because it's a bit like the chicken and the egg, really. You can't actually see if there was a... Because they're so... You know, he was quite a reclusive person. He didn't do many interviews and that sort of thing. And a lot of what we, we learn about him really has to be sort of sifted through. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to know if there ever was a specific moment. Again, maybe it was Spartacus, I don't know. But I get the impression that he, that he, he was a non-conformist. Um, and whether that was a, as a result of not being able to sort of ingratiate himself in the system, I, I really don't know. Um, but he certainly, I, I think he, he he settled into being comfortable in that role of being a nonconformist as he as he went along with his films. Sure. Um, I, and I suspect that he may have actually considered himself something of a loner, um, although he probably never dared to admit it. But he, he seemed to be uh, seemed to be most happy when you read biographies and you read people who talked about him. That he seemed to be happy in his own company. He had his own way of doing things. Um, it, it made perfect sense, you know, system things that he was doing that it made perfect sense to him. Baffled and annoyed other people, it, it fiercely protective of his own creative vision. Uh, and I suspect also that he resented having to rely on other people. If he could have made the films entirely by himself, I, I think he would have tried to, you know. Right. Um, so, so that that tends to sort of, for me, it tends to indicate somebody who's not uh, essentially comfortable with that sort of world. Sure. Um, so, and I think. As, as he was moving in that world, he would have known things, he would have seen things. It's, it's You know yourself, with like when you've talked about the music industry and all that, you do. Uh, the further and further you get into these things, you see these, you see these really, really strange things going on. And um, and I think that happened with him. I really do. I, you know, yeah. Right, yeah. Well, you mentioned Lolita there, and mm. I've kind of identified that movie as something of a turning point in his career because up to that point, his movies were... The narratives of them were fairly straightforward to my mind, you know, Paths of Glory and Spartacus. They were just straightforward stories, entertaining, you know, great films to watch. But it seems to me that from Lolita onwards, he seemed to have been communicating various aspects of the elite's agenda through each film. So yeah. Lolita was uh, in a very subtle way about paedophilia that goes on within these circles. Mm. Uh, and then you had Dr. Strangelove, which was yeah. all about, you know, Cold War and uh, elite right. depopulation plans uh, thinly veiled and stuff and 2001 you could study for days and The Shining we'll get into those but you know it seems Lolita was something of a turning point in that regard would, would you go along with that? Yeah I, I think there are some some little points with Lolita it's not overtly certainly in comparison to the films that came later but you see that first off there 
and, and subsequent films. And I think as it went on, I think he found his feet. He felt more confident with himself. He, he, he could see that he was getting more independence and, and more ability to articulate these things. So, so they, they were there. Yes, definitely. I mean, you look at uh, like we say, Doctor Strangelove. Um, Lolita, you know, there seems to be a different aspect of the elite's agenda that gets encoded into each movie. Mm. And with Lolita, it seems to be communicating, you know, in a, in a very subtle, veiled way, mm. paedophilia within yeah, the ranks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's that's definitely there. I mean, it's uh, there are some differences between um, the novel the novel version, um, Nabokov's book. Um, main main thing being the the expansion of Peter Sellers' character uh, Quilty, yeah. um, and I think by doing that, Kubrick was able to add another subtext which wasn't there really in the, as, as such in the original book, which is alluding to the existence of this paedophile network that was effectively trafficking in underage sex. Um, but I mean that, that's I think the mistake people make sometimes is by categorising Kubrick's films in a certain way. This is the one about mind control. This is the one about paedophilia. This you know that kind of mm. thing because there is there, there's a huge overlap. I mean if you look at a Clockwork Orange for example, when um, Alex's character is um, I think it's the deltoid is it the uh, the social for the comes right. to and grabs his nuts you know basically when he sat on the edge of the bedroom you know and in the book and the film Alex is only fifteen years old and. Um, mm. In the in the novel version of, of Burgess's novel of *A Clock of Orange*, uh, Alex coaxes uh, two ten-year-old girls to his bedroom for sex. In that version, obviously, they appear wow. older in the uh, in the film. But then you have in *The Shining* as well. You know, it's confirmed in the in the narrative that uh, Jack Torrance has been physically abusive towards his son Danny. Hmm. Um, but there is this subtle undercurrent that there's more going on. Sexual and I abuse. Think, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And he and he's there's a scene where he's sitting in the foyer waiting in the in the lobby waiting for um, the hotel manager and he's reading a copy of Playgirl yeah. and on the front cover of this is this article entitled Incest Why Parents Sleep With Their Children you know I mean it's mm. uh, you know, and I was watching again of course you've got the the owner of the costume hire shop who's yeah. prostituting his own his daughter, yeah, yeah yeah that's right mm. and there's a very peculiar scene in the, at the very end of the film as well which has been interpreted different ways by people but I think it speaks for itself really is um uh, Bill, is, Bill and Alice Harford's young daughter Helena appears to be led off by two strange men, um, and both these characters appear fleetingly earlier in the film at Siegler's party. So that, there's a suggestion of a sinister connection there. But freezing the film and actually looking at it, you can see that Alice turns to look at her and looks back at Bill again, and they just continue their conversation, and uh, it's almost as if it's not happening, you know. So mm. th there is that there, and of course AI as well is another example. You know, I mean it wasn't. It was Kubrick's planned film, even though Spielberg took it over. But um, after his death, but Kubrick's original intention was to explore this notion of why adults would want to to purchase artificial children that never aged. You know, mm. um, but so you, you do have these overlaps, and of course, I mean, I, I mean, if you want me to get into it or here or not, but um, there are the accusations that were made about Arthur C. Clarke as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, let's yeah. touch on that because you, yeah. you hear things about him. You know, he went out to live in Sri Lanka and you hear yeah. all sorts of uh, stories about what he got up to out there. I mean, what have we got yeah. on him? Well, it was um, uh, there is an older version of Clark's Wikipedia page, which doesn't exist now. But it, uh, it did say that I'm, I'm just going to quote from it here. It's the 26th of May 2000. Clark was made a Knight Bachelor for Services to Literature at a ceremony in Colombo. Uh, the award of a knighthood had been announced in 1998 New Year's Honours. Red uh, flag straight away, knighthood. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it makes you think of Savile and all the rest of it. So, Sirs, yeah. 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 Uh, and the award of the knighthood, yeah. Investiture of the award had been delayed at Clark's request because of an accusation by the British tabloid The Sunday Mirror of paedophilia. The charge was subsequently found to be baseless by Sri Lankan police, according to the Daily Telegraph. Uh, the Mirror subsequently published, published an apology and Clark chose not to sue for defamation and he was duly knighted. And people would say, well, that's, that's the end of that, really. You know, whether it was, is, it's been obviously whitewashed, you know, that sort of thing. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. But more recently, uh, former uh, News of the World and Sunday Mirror reporter called Graham Johnson published a book called Hack. And he gives some accounts of his time working at these newspapers. And in it, I'll quote here, he said there was an exclusive story exposing the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke as a paedophile and that the story was spiked. And then there was this interview with the, uh, the Independent Online where he said, Roger Insull said that because Arthur C. Clarke was a mate of Rupert Murdoch, the editor wasn't having any of it. And despite Roger getting a lot of evidence that Clarke was a paedophile, they wouldn't publish it, unquote. Mm. So I think that's... Talk about know, elite circles as we yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. 
And of course, what we were saying before, you know, with the contemporary revelation, revelations with what's going on now, some of this sick and depraved behaviour of these high-profile public figures, you, mm. you, you do have to wonder what Kubrick um, knew. I'm not for any second saying that he was involved. but Yeah, um, sure. But you, uh, you, you wonder what he must have known. Mm. And I've got some more questions later about what he might have known about certain things. Yeah. Um, just while we're on the subject of Lolita and leading on to Dr. Strangelove, because Peter Sellers was involved in both those movies. Are you familiar with Greg Hallett? Do you know? Greg Hallett, I did uh, an interview with him a, a while back, and he's a New Zealander, but he claims that he's the legitimate king of England. And what he claims is that the royal bloodline was usurped at some point during Queen Victoria's reign, right. and that every monarch since has been illegitimately, that's if you consider royalty to be legitimate in the first no. place, <laughs> has been illegitimately uh, placed there, mm -hmm. and that there's an entirely different bloodline that kind of branched off, right. and that he is the guy that uh, has been nominated and should be taking the throne right now. But anyway, uh, he's got this alternative family tree of the royals, and right. he was showing me this chart when I was with him uh, a few months ago, and he claims that the Rothschilds infiltrated the royal bloodline. Why would that be too much of a surprise? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they got their kind of uh, genealogy involved there. But that Peter Sellers was an illegitimate son of one of the royals. <laughs> and that this was always known within elite circles. Right. And that would be the reason why Peter Sellers was placed in the public eye, because this is what they do with people yeah, from yeah, yeah. important bloodlines. Um, but you also then are reminded of the fact that he died at a relatively long, young age, I think mm. it was 52, think of was, yeah, a yeah. heart attack, we're told, and you've got to wonder what that was all about. Yeah, I just yeah, wondered yeah. if you'd come across that about Peter Sellers. Uh, I haven't, actually. No, that's the first I've heard of it. It wouldn't surprise me, because there, there are some very, very strange things about uh, Sellers, definitely. Mm. Um, uh, many, many years ago, I, I can't recall the name of it, there was a film made, um, I think it was Jeffrey, somebody who played him, in it, um, so yeah, like Jeffrey a, Rush. That's the one, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and although the film was put across in a very very strange way with these sort of daydreams that were almost sort of MK Ultra type sort of things, you know. But uh, mm. seeing sort of the way his his life developed and his strange behaviour and like, yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting but, movie that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, there are a few things I do know. I, I certainly um, find it very strange. There are some. I wrote some stuff quite a while back about how he cropped up in uh, the Muppet Show of all things, and how uh, the Disney connection with uh, mind control and stuff like that. And of course, if you look at these guests that were on that show, I mean, I'm just going off completely on a tangent here, but no, there worry, are these I'll really, really the odd things about Peter Sellers. Or certainly, you look at a film like Being There, uh, the 1979 yeah. film that he made. It's loaded with Masonic imagery, and again, that chimes with Kubrick because you have the story of an ordinary man who's inadvertently thrown into the middle of elite circles and yeah. just doesn't have a clue what's. Uh, you know, um, Absolutely. and uh, and also apparently he had a dalliance with uh, Freemasonry as well. He was inducted into the Chelsea Lodge um, in July 1948. Hmm. If my memory serves me. Um, I, I they say that he wasn't a mason, a mason for very long, but uh, it's difficult to confirm how long he was. But I know that his father was a lifelong Freemason. Hmm. Um, so, and he got hooked up with Britt Eklund as well. You've got to wonder yeah. how he managed yeah. to pull that one off because uh, <laughs> yeah. he was he wasn't the best looking guy in the world, but right. uh, he pulled a cracker there, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, Although, uh, uh, I've, yeah, Britt Eklund, as as the years went by, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but in <laughs> a, a heyday, change, yeah, in a heyday, absolutely. And uh, let's not get into beta sex kitten programming <laughs> as part of MK well, Ultra in in, yeah, in yeah, this yeah. conversation, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, yeah, and certainly I would say that certainly with eyes wide shut, it's. Uh, there's a load of uh, clues to that in there. Yeah. I oh, would yeah. go as far as to argue that pretty much all of the uh, female characters in that film have, have been conditioned in some form or another. So. Yeah, monarchs yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, Greg Hallett did mention being there to me, and he said mm. it's a very key movie because uh, yeah, yeah, Peter yeah. Sellers had a lot of control over it. And he did, there's, didn't he? Yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's being communicated below the surface there. Yeah. And Greg Hallett also says that he's in it. Right, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> Very interesting stuff. But anyway, yeah. uh, so the other movie that Peter Sellers featured in of Kubrick's was Dr. Strangelove. Mm, 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 and yeah. the thing that I always remember about that when I think about, you know, truth issues and conspiracy issues is you've got the character played by Sterling Hayden. And yeah. he goes off on a bit of a diatribe talking about how uh, the powers that be are trying to poison 
something about our precious bodily fluids or you know poison the water or something you probably remember what the line is but it seems to be quite striking given what we can understand about the new world order depopulation agenda and the united nations agenda 21 and all the stuff that's involved in that it would certainly appear reading between the lines that there were some aspects of that that were kind of being subtly conveyed there yeah there are some quite interesting things about that film. I mean, if we could start with that, I mean, it's well. I mean, I would say first of all that, um, like, as with everything, he, I, I do think Kubrick coded these things in his films. Hmm. He said he was on. He was on record actually saying he loved it when people took the time to interpret his films, and, and tellingly, he never really revealed his, his intended meaning to the in, in, in interviews. And that. Yeah, he didn't, did he? Uh, no, no. But he, 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 I think that was uh, that was something that he was really proud of that people, when people did take the time to study these things and find these truths in them. But of course, if, I mean, we, we, we were saying about Dr. Strange, I'll start with that. I mean, um, Kubrick wanted Pentagon support uh, to realis- realistically portray certain elements in the film. The Pentagon refused uh, after they'd read the script, um, which says a lot from the outset, really. Um, but if you, so you have to ask what it was that they didn't like about it. And I think the question is really quickly answered when you see the film. We have these recreated interiors of a B-52 bomber uh, that were allegedly so realistic the Pentagon inquired as to how Kubrick was getting access to highly accurate and guarded information. Um, and a couple of interesting figures connected to the film as well. Um, in the production, during the production, Kubrick consulted Alistair Buchan, who was the head of the Institute for Strategic Studies, which was part of uh, the legacy of Cecil Rhodes, uh, historic connection to the Round Table, Henry Kissinger, the Rothschilds again, that sort of thing. And Alistair Buchan pointed Kubrick to Peter George's novel Red Alert, which Doctor Strange was loosely based on. And Peter George was a British intelligence officer. Um, he was co-credited as a film screenplay writer with Terry Southern. And um, in- incidentally, it was Southern that introduced Kubrick to A Clockwork Orange, the novel of Clockwork Orange during 2001. Hmm. Um, but Southern, and incidentally Peter Sellers, while we're on the subject as well, both had an extensive relationship with the Laurel Canyon scene. They lived there, they had properties there. And, and when that, I always think whenever you hear that, those two words, Laurel Canyon, your bells start going off because you, you, know, you start wondering about military and CIA connections. Yeah. And that's a real pet not, subject yeah, of mine yeah, right now. That's it. I mean, if anyone's not familiar, I mean, obviously the, the research that you've done, is, but also um, Dave McGowan, who, bless him, is not, you know, not with us anymore. Absolutely, but, um, yeah. A fantastic researcher, and um, that book, the book uh, "Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon." Uh, people should check that out if they haven't already. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And um, and just one more thing as well. I was saying about Sterling Hayden. Um, he had an extensive career in the OSS as well. So, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so, Who'd have thought it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, connections everywhere. And I've got to ask you: the character played by Peter Sellers, uh, the German mm. doctor, yeah. strikes me as looking very like Henry Kissinger. And right. I wonder if you think that was supposed to be a parody of Kissinger. It uh, wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, interestingly, um, the closest I've got to finding out what the, who the character was based on was um, uh, allegedly an amalgamation of Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and two other interesting characters here now as well. L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons, who was the rocket pioneer who founded JPL and was very deep occultist as well. Hmm. Um, apparently, his, his character was an amalgamation of these ca- three characters. But I'm sure, like you say, there would have been other other people in the limelight that would have uh, figured into that as well. And I can see the I can see the uh, resemblance. Yeah, definitely with uh, with Kissinger. Yeah. 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 Let me just chuck in a couple of questions about 2001, mm. uh, which have kind of occurred to me while we've been chatting. I find it very interesting that in the original screenplay by Arthur C. Clarke, the planet that the Discovery spacecraft was uh, headed for mm. was Saturn. It was, yes. And it was replaced in the movie by Jupiter. Mm. Now, Saturn is a name that makes a lot of people's ears prick up when they've, <laughs> <Mine>. done, <laughs> when they've done research into sort of truth slash conspiracy slash mm. occult issues. Mm-hmm. And it's quite telling that it featured in that original story, but for yeah. some reason was <clears throat> substituted for Jupiter. And we get mm. this very weak kind of explanation for it, I think, which yeah, is on the yeah. official record, which was that when they were making all the models for the movie, they couldn't accurately recreate the rings of Saturn. Any thoughts on why that might have been? 
Um, I suspect it's uh, pretty obvious, really. It was um, if you look at sort of the whole sort of the idea of the primary material and alchemy, and that is certainly the black stones, the black monoliths, and all that kind of thing. It's, yeah, it's very much cubes. a part of um, of that sort of the Saturn worship theme. Um, right. And Clark himself actually said that he was he he looked at the analogy of the Kaaba stone in um, you know which is another example of that the black stone that the Muslims, uh, which is reputed, yeah, reputed to be a, a meteorite of some sort, yeah. and Clark had said that he originally envisioned this a sort of weird sort of tetrahedron meteorite crystal type thing with a black stone in the middle of it, something like that, you know. So it went through various changes to become the uh, the monolith. But I think, yeah, I think that whole everything about it smacks of Saturn worship, and I think there would have. I, sus I think probably it was the NASA people, with the NASA people being involved, and I'm, I'm certainly not the first person to have said this, and probably researchers have said it long before I've ever said it, but um, hmm. um, this idea that there would have been highly placed, I think it was Jay Widener actually who said it, highly placed occultists, yep. uh, NASA, that were, were, were sort of connected to the production of 2001, and that somewhere along the line they would have stepped in uh, and said something, you know, you, you can't do this. It would have been a bit too obvious. Yeah, yeah. But I think there are, I mean, there are, there are subtle giveaways. I mean, certainly if you look at how the story progresses throughout, through Clark's novels, and you get into sort of 2010 and the sequel novel, and he did change the, the, the location to Jupiter then, even though, like you say, it was Saturn in the, in the novel version, in the first novel version. Um, but then it, there's something about it that doesn't make sense, because you have these monoliths that create, it's almost like an alchemical process that turns Jupiter into a star. Which incidentally they call Luc they call Lucifer in the novel, and if if that's the case, then how would that have proceeded if if they'd have stuck with the, the original idea of Jupiter being the uh, Saturn, sorry, being this that would have gone through this transformation? Because, as I understand it, the two uh, in Saturn worship, the two sort of this idea Lucifer, the, the morning star Venus, that sort of thing, and then you have Saturn, which is the the black sun, the black star. They sort of sit in juxtaposition with each other. The one one is not as effective without the other kind of thing. We have this sort of black and white in Freemasonry, the, the contradiction of the one and the other sort of thing. Mm. Um, if that was the case, that it would Saturn would have gone this transformation to become, there, there wouldn't have been that balance there then in, in the narrative and sort of looking at it, looking at it on that level. Mm. So I, I don't quite get, my, I, could, I have trouble getting my head around that sort of thing. Um, sure. But of course, even mm. Kubrick himself. I mean, it's it's he's not blatantly coming out and saying it. But I think it was Frederick Ira Ordway who was one of the NASA people involved with two thousand and one. He said they were persisting uh, to get these to, like you say, to realise these rings. The special effects people weren't happy with it. Blah blah blah. Um, no I mean, basically, in, in a nutshell, um, Kubrick expressed. He was very, very unhappy for the rest of the production after that. Mm. They they had done the, some work on Saturn. And we know that that work was done because um, I think it was Douglas Trumbull who directed Silent Running, used the footage that they'd actually put together for um, 2001. Yeah, that was all that about film. Saturn, yeah, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and actually, when you look at it, as far as I know, he didn't tweak any of that. It was the existing footage that they already put together for 2001. But as far as I'm concerned, when you look at it, it's not, it's not bad footage at all. Hmm. You know, it's perfectly, it, it holds up perfectly fine, you know. Absolutely, um, yeah. But Kubik was not happy. Yeah, and I've got to, I'm, not, I'm struggling to find them. But uh, I have quotes where he was, I think it was Fred, uh, Ira, Ira Ordway that said, you know, he, he, he was moping around the set basically for the rest of the production and kept badgering them and saying, look, you know, we can do this, but they, so, so was that, was it Kubrick, you know, was it, was it, was some, you know, was it the, a collective amongst the production that, that scuppered uh, mm. the Saturn, was, was Kubrick, did Kubrick intend to stay with it, you know, so, I mean, you have yeah. to wonder about that as well, so. So many questions, man, mm. and mm. one which I've got, which I've not heard any other um, researcher raise, and I've never heard anyone sort of speculate on this, but I've always wondered why it was that 2001, was chosen to be the year in the future in which this story was set, <laughs> yeah. when the story was written in, you know, yeah. the 1960s. Yeah. And of course, uh, did any, anything interesting happen in 2001? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> September 11th. Yeah. So uh, yeah. you've got to wonder yeah. whether, you know, 35 years before or mm. whatever it was, there was some kind of inside knowledge of what was going to come in 2001 yeah and that's the reason it was selected yeah. as this year for you know this momentous mm. event that was being communicated mm. this is all in line with the concept of placing the truth in plain sight yeah. predictive yeah. programming yeah. and all that yeah. but you know 
I would have thought that if they were going to pick a year in the future, they might have picked 2000, the start mm. of a new millennium. Yeah, but for yeah. some reason, it was 2001. And I've never really yeah. heard anyone speculate on whether that could be some kind of allusion to 9-11. Uh, it's interesting you to say that because I've actually fairly recently done some research on that because somebody alerted me to, uh, again, it was Jay Widener um, that had been talking about this. And uh, he was basically saying that, um, I'm just trying to find some quotes from him. But uh, yeah, he said Kubrick knew something that was going to happen in 2001. He'd heard that something huge was going to happen. One of the buildings, the World Trade Center, I think it's number four, was exactly the shape of the monolith. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure where he would have got, where Jay Wyden has got this information from or whether he's just... Well, actually, but, uh, when, when you think about it, the black monoliths look very similar is, to, yeah, the, to the yeah. towers, yeah. That's right, it is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, some interesting bits and pieces I can put together for you here is that, like you say, it had several names. The film didn't get named 2001 until April 1965, I think it was, yeah, when it was called 2001. Hmm. And the designs for the World Trade Center were unveiled in January 1964, so it's around about the same time there. But what's interesting is you've got literally a month apart um, from the naming of the film, the, the New York Port Authority start acquiring property. To, ready for the construction of the World Trade Center. Um, That's right. Just yeah. a few weeks before, literally just a few couple of weeks before the name changed to 2001. I think it was uh, Planet Fall or something like that. It went into the number and had Journey Beyond the Stars, Universe yeah. Tour of the Stars, I think was another name for it before. So it's like production of the movie um, and production mm, of the World Trade Center yeah, Towers yeah, yeah. ran concurrently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I'm just trying to look at some of my other dates here. So, But what's, it, what's interesting as well is the dates in the film because... It is, it is very difficult to nail down exactly what happens when in, in the narrative of the film. There is a jump in it that says 18 months later in 2001, an on-screen sort of uh, cards to thing. Mm. But I, I, I came across this chap who's done a, 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 he's done a hell of a lot of research and he's looked into some of the production notes as well that were written by Kubrick. And he's put together a, a timeline of, of events, basically, uh, for 2001. This is, this is what I found out, that basically... Uh, the, the Dr. Floyd's mission to the lunar monolith earlier in the film takes place in April 2001. And that is essentially where the cover-up story of the monolith begins, as did, you know, in that year, 2001, as did the cover-up story of 9-11 in 2001, obviously after, after the events. Mm. Um, and you have the discovery mission itself, which is, again, is, a, is shrouded in secrecy. There's a cover-up of that as well, is announced in August 2001. And a couple of other, August the 5th actually, a couple of other little in, in, in synchronicities here that the cornerstone for the Statue of Liberty was laid on August the 5th as well as that same day. So um, the crew for the Discovery craft in the film were revealed on October the 22nd, 2001, uh, which was the date of the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 as well. So, uh, so you've got another synchronicity there. What's mm. really weird is that the narrative then jumps forward and we have the hibernation crew uh, based uh, uh, placed on board the Discovery on September the 10th, but this is actually 2002 in the in the, the chronology. But it's still an interesting date there, 2000, mm, September the sure 10th. Sure is. And Dave Bowman and Frank Poole allegedly board the craft on September the 12th. So the crew are placed on board either side of September the 11th. Very so interesting. In 2000 and there's one other little thing as well, and I, people joke about this one, but it's interesting that. Early in the film, uh, Dr. Hayward Floyd's talking to his daughter, who's incidentally played by uh, Vivian Kubrick in the film, um, on like a, a video screen. And uh, based on the timeline, that would have been 2001 then. And he says to his daughter, what would you like for, a, uh, for your birthday? And then she says, a bush baby. And what's one of the main things, other than 9-11, that we remember about 2001? President Bush. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Isn't I mean, sync maybe incredible? Maybe it's nothing, but, you know, it's, you know, wow. it's there. So. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. And um, you got the HAL computer, H-A-L, and, of course, a lot yeah. of people have uh, said that, pointed out that if you move it one letter back, you get IBM. IBM and was yeah. that a communication of, you know, the early days of computing <clears throat> and a knowledge of what was to come with IBM? I think that's yeah. even on the public record that it was a, it a, is, a, yes. a representation of that. Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, there's a there's a tie in there as well with um, NASA because you've got um, the origins of NASA being with the um, the, the paperclip scientists, and um, and there's a lot of tie in there with IBM as well. So you know, it's uh, it's right. interesting that these particular companies and and organisations were working hand in hand to produce uh, 2001, like IBM and Bell Labs was another one as well, which I think there was some connection between 
them and uh, and, and the Nazis in uh, World War Two. I'm not. Mm. I have to double check that one, but uh, yeah, I think there is there. So. And there's a point where Bowman is dismantling the Hell computer, mm. and um, it kind of uh, goes a bit haywire. Yeah. And it mentions that it's an HAL nine thousand computer, and it was constructed, and it gives the date of its construction. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you can remember it, but wasn't it 1992? Was it? 90, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So I wonder if yeah. there's I any. I think it was actually spoken ending. in the dialogue on um, 2010, the sequel film. I think it was actually part of the dialogue of the film that it's that was clarified properly. I'd have to watch it again to remember what it was exactly. But mm. uh, yeah, okay. That's right. So it seems a good point to jump into Jay Widener's theory mm. that uh, Stanley Kubrick was hired to fake the Apollo moon landings on behalf of NASA. And that 2001, the production of it, was kind of a practice run for the film sets that would be used in the fake Apollo moon landings. And I did actually interview Jay Widener about it a couple of years ago. People want to go back and, you know, recap on that whole volume. It's quite a a well-known theory now. Mm -hmm. And in the documentary film Room 237, where you've got four people's interpretation of what The Shining is all about, Mm. Uh, Jay Widener's is kind of the standout theory, which is that Stanley encoded elements of what he'd done in terms of faking the Apollo landings into Mm -hmm. The Shining so that those that could interpret the symbology and read between the lines Mm. would understand all about it. So it was his way of confessing, but obviously he was unable to overtly confess because he wouldn't have lasted too long afterwards. Mm -hmm. So he kind of encoded it in. And (laughs) I, I wonder whether you buy into that. What do you make of it? Um, yeah, I've I've done quite a few sort of interviews on this and written a, a huge amount of material on it. But um, I will I'd like to say for, to start with, if it's okay with you, just to, from the outset that I, I am actually sometimes misquoted as being one of these people that believes that Kubrick um, was involved and that he, he was re- responsible for faking it. Um, I don't actually take that position. I don't think that there's currently any evidence to prove conclusively, absolutely conclusively, that he was involved. Um, I say that with a couple of provisos. So, firstly, the, the uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the least bit if he was. I will say that. And secondly, he certainly had the means to realistically pull it off. I mean, if you look at Jay Widener's hypothesis with the uh, the notion of projection, creating realistic looking lunar landscapes, backgrounds, and that you know, it's, it was it was within uh, the realm of possibility. Um, but it's not conclusive, that isn't. It's 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 just infinitely possible, plausible, but it's you know it's not sort of. And I do like to sort of go where the evidence leads. Right. Um, um, but what I'm more interested in, and I think there is a, a huge wealth of evidence for this, is more not so much that Kubrick was involved, but that Kubrick knew that the that Apollo um, lunar fakery had taken place, and that, and of course that idea rests on the assumption that NASA did engage in fakery of some sort. And I, I know there's a lot of people out there who would fiercely reject any suggestion that NASA, NASA was ever engaged in any fakery of any kind. But unfortunately, the truth is that there is evidence, and it's pretty damning evidence, that NASA did fake something about the Apollo uh, program. Well, I think um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remain sort of cautious about committing myself to what it was that they were actually faking and covering up because I don't think it's currently clear what but the facts remain if you look at the footage transmitted footage the astronaut accounts technical specifications of the Apollo missions the hardware uh, they do support the conclusion that that, 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 that that something was faked and and I think that's where Kubrick comes into it because I think he knew I'm not ruling out the possibility that he may have been involved uh, but I think that's more conclusive evidence that he, that he knew that he knew that this fakery had, had gone on um, I'm very, like I say, I'm very open to the possibility that he was involved, but I think the evidence is stronger that he knew as opposed to being involved. So, right. I mean, I can go through some examples of, of that evidence if you want me to. But it's well, yeah. Uh, I mean, just before that, Widener mm. cites things like you have the word Apollo on mm-hmm. Danny's jumper and yeah, a rocket right, on yeah, his yeah. jumper as he rises up from the floor. Absolutely. And yeah. then you have this Native American design uh, yeah. on the on yeah. the wall of the hotel, which looks like three rockets taken off. And so he he cites all these things as mm-hmm. being little symbolic yeah. clues yeah. pertaining yeah. to the Apollo mission. Yeah. I, well, I think those would be the, that those would be part of the body of evidence that shows that that Kubrick knew about it. Right, um, and the hotel would, manager, the Barry yeah, Nelson guy, yeah, looking a bit right. like JFK. And yeah, yeah, like you say, we've got Jack Nicholson interviewed by uh, the manager. Looks like JFK. He's wearing red, white, and blue, and he's wearing this hairpiece that makes him look a bit more like JFK. There's a, an eagle statuette um, sitting on the office window, and yep. you know some people believe that alludes to like the eagle has landed and the the eagle craft. You know, mm. there's several eagles in the film actually. Jack Torrance 
has got one on his t-shirt which incidentally is reversed in mirrors so there's like a sort of a cult touch to that as well uh, the film was produced by Hawk Films one of um, Kubrick's uh, outfits and Peregrine Film Production as well it was called so got two birds of prey there as well plus the typewriter the Adler typewriter which is the German word for eagle uh, you know so you, you've got all of that you, like you say you've got the uh, uh, Danny's jumper with the Apollo 11 USA and it's got satin rocket on it as well mm-hmm. and then there's room 237 which I think it was Jay Widener who quoted the American Heritage Science Dictionary that measured the at that point in time the average distance between the earth and the moon yeah. was 237,000 miles yeah which I think has been currently revised but um, I think it's closer to 216 yeah. now they say don't they yeah yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, one That's thing right. One thing you also hear from the Widener theory is that uh, the Jack Nicholson character, Jack Torrance, mm-hmm. was supposed to be a representation of Stanley because himself, by, yeah. by that point, Stanley had started to uh, look a bit scruffy and he sported a beard and, you know, he resembled the Nicholson character in, in, in some ways. Mm-hmm. And so the kind of trials and tribulations that Jack Torrance was going through in the movie was supposed to be conveying some of what Stanley himself was going through, according yeah, yeah. to the theory. Yeah. I think if even even if you, um, it would be a heavy burden to know something. I know I'm trying to sort of support what I'm saying on this, but um, even uh, obviously it would be a huge burden if you were involved in something. But I think even knowing something, uh, even if you weren't necessarily involved, in knowing something and trying to articulate that information to the wider. Hmm. public uh, would would take a would be a very uh, you know heavy burden on anybody well, it takes us, it takes us back to the 911 thing you know if exactly, there was full knowledge yeah. of that that's right yeah and i think whereas there would be some people in the media who who basically couldn't care less uh, you know of the repercussions of these things you know and what they know and people not knowing and voice of it or, or even predictive programming whereas i think it would have been different for kubrick you certainly hmm. get the impression that he he did have a conscience, and he did. Yeah, yeah, it does hint at him being conscientious and wanting mm. to do as much as he could to communicate things, but realising yeah. that he couldn't come right out and say it. That's right. Yeah. Or he wouldn't see the sunrise in the morning. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, you also hear that he started to get very paranoid uh, mm. After 2001, he took to riding around his St. Albans estate in a golf buggy or something with, with yeah. a loaded gun, kind of patrolling the walls. And, you know, he had a state-of-the-art security system, almost, almost as if he kind of expected somebody to be coming for him. I don't know how yeah. true those stories are, but you hear that he got very paranoid. Yeah, yeah. there just seemed to be some truth to some of them. I know that, that, know that the, the idea of that he was wandering around his estate with a shotgun. There was some truth to that, but I'm not sure as that was whether there'd been some sort of, uh, um, what's the word for it, somebody was basically just wandering around on the grounds and he'd gone out to check for himself to see, and he had the shotgun, you know. So, um, so yeah, there is that. And um, I think when you look at his reasons for coming from America to the UK, uh, he cited, officially, it was cited as being the state of the crime and uh, that sort of thing violence in New York and that he wanted to sort of have a more peaceful lifestyle bringing up his children as well but I, I can't help but wonder sometimes whether the, there's more to these stories I mean certainly I would argue that that's the case with A Clockwork Orange when people said that uh, he'd been threatened by these people uh, the police had gone to his house and said um, you know one of these days they're going to turn up on your front door and murder you and your family sort of thing hmm. and then he pulls A Clockwork Orange from um, circulation in the yeah in the UK I mean, it's almost unheard of. I mean, you, you really would have to have uh, a hell of a lot of clout to uh, to basically instruct Warner Brothers to, um, you know, to pull a film that yeah. was making a lot of money for them. You know, I mean, you really... I mean, he did have a lot of clout. Well, this kind know, of ties but, back into Widener's theory, which states yeah. that, um, you know, in exchange for Stanley's complicity in faking the moon landings... Mm-hmm. Uh, he was given carte blanche to make any kind mm, of film mm. he wanted for the rest of his career yeah, yeah, and yeah. that would certainly explain how he would have the clout to be able to it, withdraw it, it a would actually, orange. yes yes it would yeah mm. yes it would yeah just yeah. to throw that in there yeah hmm okay so a clockwork orange itself i know you said earlier that there's you shouldn't just interpret kubrick films in terms of this is the one about no. this subject and this is the one yeah, about the other yeah. because there's always so much more going on but mm. it does ostensibly seem to be a kind of reveal about certain aspects of mk ultra yeah, style yeah, mind yeah. control with the experiments that are done on uh, alex mm. when you know at the hands of the state so yeah. i wonder if that was some kind of statement about this sort of thing going on in reality yeah yeah i think that was probably the purest of um and I, th- I actually think it's probably one of the most blatant of his films as well in, in sort of conveying um, what's, what's going on, the bigger picture sort of thing. 
And I, and again, that I do wonder if that was maybe why somebody instructed him to pull the film as opposed to. Um, if you look at a lot of the people that were involved with the origins of MK Ultra, you know they were ostensibly sort of um, British scientists and social engineers and psychiatrists and psychologists, that sort of thing. So um, certainly Tavistock had a big Tavistock Institute had a big part in it. So uh, maybe I mean that's just speculation on my part. I've got no proof of that, but sure. um, um, but yeah, I think it's there, there doesn't seem to be an awful lot else conveyed other than the social engineering aspects of um, um, that how you can use. Um, manipulation and psychological sort of that change, behavior and all that sort of thing to change mm. people's behavior. So, so yeah. But again, that's that's another one that's interesting because if you look at Kubrick himself, he said that uh, social satire dealing with questions of whether behavioral psychology, uh, psychological condition are dangerous new weapons for a totalitarian government to use to impose vast controls on its citizens and turn them into little more than robots. That that was his. Uh, the way he basically ex described the film mm. and he went further than that and said uh, it warns against the new psychedelic fascism the eye popping multimedia quadrasonic drug orientated conditioning of human beings by other beings which many believe will usher in the forfeiture of human citizenship and the beginning of zombiedom unquote mm. so it's pretty blatant really what he was trying to do it wasn't so veiled as his other films and it also depicts a dystopian future. And we've mm. got so many films now all about this nightmare dystopian future, you know, sort of part Brave New World, part 1984. Yeah. Um, so he was kind of ahead, of ahead of his time in doing it mm. as long ago as he did with The Clockwork Orange. But yeah. it certainly seems to be conveying this nightmare kind of, you know, uh, martial law type society that mm. we seem to be hurtling towards by the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know. I think it was Lucy Sargeson who was a uh, um, histor historian of the Nottingham University, and she did a lot of research into uh, dystopias and all that. And she, although she doesn't go as far as to accept that, that, that there's cover-ups and things going on in the world now, but she certainly accepted that dystopias and that were were a reflection of the times in which they were written. And I think if you look at what was going on in the 1970s, and especially in the UK. Um, it, you could extrapolate quite easily forward uh, from that point, uh, just as I suppose Orwell did in the 1940s with um, 1984, you know. Mm. Um, it is a natural extension of the way sometimes you can see you don't particularly need to, to have any insight into um, sort of elite sort of agendas um, to extrapolate certain things. But that's not to say that that wasn't the case with Clockwork Orange because um, I, I do know that... Um, there's certainly a good deal of evidence suggesting that um, Kubrick, uh, and, and if not Kubrick himself, certainly Anthony Burgess, who wrote the, uh, the novel version of Clock of Orange, uh, was getting a lot of input from people in the CIA and the um, British intelligence as well about sort of mind control projects and social engineering and psyops and things like that. So, mm. so it would reflect that very well, yeah. 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 And it's interesting that Stanley, uh, his wish was for a Clockwork Orange to be pulled from distribution, mm -hmm. but pretty much the minute he died, yeah. it's straight back out there in the cinemas again. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so his his yeah. wish was certainly observed, but um, mm. only for as long as he was alive. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So well, maybe that says something about what you know, his death. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get into a much more interesting one then, which is Eyes Wide Shut. That's one you mm. can talk about for days. Many people think this represented Kubrick just going too far in terms of what he was revealing about elite secrets, and particularly the ritual orgy scenes that we had. Uh, filmed in a Rothschild mansion, I believe. Just, That's right, yeah. Just remind me yeah. which, which house that was. It was uh, Menmore Towers. I, I, I think it's down south somewhere. I can't remember. I know it's not that far away from uh, Milton Keynes. But, um, right, because I live just along yeah. the road from Wadston Manor, which is another oh, right. country pile of the yeah, Rothschilds. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so we had this, this orgy scene going on. And, mm. um, you know, many people that study what these elite types get up to will tell you that that was a fairly accurate depiction yeah. of one of their rituals. It was deeply satanic and steeped in Saturn imagery as well, of course. Mm. And many people will tell you that as a result of putting this stuff out and just taking it a step too far, Stanley was taken out in March 1999 by way of a convenient heart attack, mm. which, uh, yeah. because he'd presumably broken some oath of secrecy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he did die fairly suddenly mm. around the time mm. of that movie appearing. Mm. So, uh, what are your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, um, I think it's. 
I tend to be quite pragmatic about these things. It's certainly, you know, people that people do die of natural heart attacks and they can die very suddenly and, you know, we have to accept that. But I think it's a mistake to assume that, that people uh, aren't bumped off for going against the system. We know for a fact that that happens. I mean, one very simplistic example is the CIA whistleblower, um, I'm trying to think of her name now, Mary Embry, that's it. Uh, revealed during the 1970s that the CIA had got this gun that fired an untraceable dart that could trigger natural looking heart attacks and uh, when they did the uh, you know the autopsy afterwards it would just look like a perfectly normal natural heart attack right. and they stated as well that they, I think this was um, uh, yeah they stated that they'd actually bumped people off in that manner so I'm not, I'm not saying that that's specifically what happened it's to like James Bond to stuff people, isn't it? yeah 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 it's very real stuff hmm. um, but it's I mean it's completely plausible that he died of a natural heart attack but his death was very surprising, it was very untimely, and if you look at what Eyes Wide Shut is about, and you look at all the things that happen afterwards as well, um, it wouldn't surprise me if he was bumped off at all because of it, so, yeah, mm. yeah. And if you think about it, really, I mean, like you say, you've got, you've got a Kubrick film, and he's basically telling the viewer that the elite types are having these secretive gatherings, they're practicing all kinds of ritualistic and sexual shenanigans and whatnot, um, that when their cover is potentially blown, they have no qualms about murdering or intimidating other people to keep their little secrets. Add to this the fact, like we said before, you've got these characters and it appear to be under some sort of conditioning, programming and that, uh, and you've got symbolic allusions to that throughout the film. And even just watching the film, even if you're not aware of these things, I know of people who have sat down and watched Eyes Wide Shut without any of sort of this insight. And they've got, they, they just can't get their head around the film. It's, they know there's something unsettling about it, but they... It's like they don't just don't seem to get it. It's just, it but, the, but the one thing that they will admit is that there's something about it that unnerved them. Hmm. Um, and I think that says a lot. I'd probably go as far as to say it's probably one of the most revelatory films ever made, actually. But um, I think it probably is, yeah. Mm, mm. And there's said to be 20-odd minutes of footage that were yeah. trimmed from the final version by the studio, which, yeah. which seemingly nobody has ever seen. Mm. Although I did hear a story a year or so ago that a part of one of these deleted scenes resurfaced somewhere, right. even though it's not been released. Right. Uh, so it leads you to wonder what could have been included in those 20-odd minutes mm, that mm. nobody's ever seen. I know of two definitely confirmed ones. It are a scene where, and they, they sound sort of innocent really, but you never, you, out of context you don't know, there are some stills of them floating around on the internet of the Harford family on a rowing boat uh, on an afternoon outing on a lake. There's also another one of Alice and the daughter Helena uh, going horse riding um, so we know we've we know those scenes were cut. Now we know that they were filmed and they were cut. They sound innocent um, enough. They do, but you never know. You never know. Yeah. But more sort of um, suspect is one that has been confirmed. Now it's been confirmed since about two thousand and thirteen. Is at uh, one hour nineteen minutes and twenty seven seconds into the film, there is a cut where uh, Doctor uh, Bill Harford finds himself separated from the masked woman. Uh, I'm just reading from this article. Yeah, he walks down a hallway, distantly following a couple. He turns to see an empty room with a pentagram-like circle in the centre. The reaction in his eyes can be seen in the close-up. Acting as if, he'd, uh, if he did not see the ceremony room, he continues to walk down the hallway, which can be seen at one, minute, uh, one hour, 19 minutes and 30 seconds. So there's a, there is something there. Um, yeah, I remember yeah, seeing yeah, that article. Yeah. yeah, and there's all these other little things as well. I was reading this article that, um, by Eric Kirsten saying that, um, to sum in the no, there's quite a lot cut from the ceremonial scene, i.e. child sacrifice, which would bear out all the stuffy preparations for this descent into sort of posh spice health in the film. You know, that's an unquote, that's what she says. And there's also some other claims as well that Kubrick attempted to insert uh, subliminal triggers intended to break um, mind control programming of certain people in the audience um, that may have cost him his life uh, I don't know how true that is it's uh, I haven't yeah. come across anything to back it up but it's it's interesting isn't it? nevertheless yeah um, sure is so yeah yeah but then you have some real other oddities as well like you've got um, I mean it was, I think the final cut of the film which was his cut um, was like seven days before he died I think the seventh second of March he and Nicole Kidman Tom Cruise and the Warner chairman, Bob Daly and Terry Semmel, viewed it. And then on the 4th, I think it was viewed by his close family and friends. And then, of course, three days later, they found dead of a massive heart attack. And then you get the film coming out in... Uh, which is interesting, actually, the date. Kubrick, which... I mean, this may support the, the idea that Kubrick was involved with uh, NASA fakery. Um, that he stated in the contract for the film that it would be released, and it was... Hmm. 
uh, in the United States on July the 16th, 1999, which is exactly 30 years to the day that the Apollo 11 Saturn V rocket was launched. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> but anyway, I mean, yeah. you have the film was released and you have Bob Daly and Terry Semmel uh, at the world premiere of Eyes Wide Shut announced their simultaneous retirement from Warner Brothers, the co-heads of Warner Brothers. And they also simultaneously announced that they were donating a hundred thousand dollars to the film foundation. So is that just a case of coincidental timing or is there something else going on there? I mean it's yeah, very, oh, yeah. very suspect. Very suspect. Yeah. Some other very good questions. Mm. Um, we kinda skipped over The Shining. We we touched on it, but mm. um the thing about The Shining is uh, a lot of people have commented on how Stanley's film version differed so much from Stephen King's novel. Mm. And we hear that Stephen King himself was very pissed off with the way the film yeah. turned out because he felt it didn't make sense of the story mm. and it was, mm. you know, incomprehensible. So this yeah. certainly supports the idea that a lot of that movie consisted of symbolism mm. and, and, you know, hidden things that Stanley wanted to convey. And mm. it was more important to him to get certain scenes in to achieve that. I mean, it's it's loaded. I would go. I would suggest to anybody to go away, and um, you could spend days, weeks, months, probably over, you know, looking through the film and um, picking it to pieces because there is, there is so much there. And I think what people sometimes miss the point with 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 Stanley Kubrick is that everything was intentionally placed in his films. You know, there was not a a costume, a hairstyle, yeah. a, a set piece. Because there's continuity errors. Continuity errors, so called, in The Shining, which have been highlighted by people mm. that have studied it. But, yeah. you know, you then get the view that Stanley would not have been sloppy enough to have missed this, and they've got to be in there for a reason. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can give you another example. I mean, uh, not to divert away from um, um, The Shining, because we can return to it in just one second, but I'll give you another example of something. Uh, and people, it's baffled people, but in 2001. There's a scene where Dr. Floyd meets with a group of scientists. I think one of them was, um, his name escapes me, he was in... Um, Leonard Rossiter. That's the chap, yes, yeah. that's the one. Rigsby. Yeah. yeah, Rigsby, I was thinking of Rigsby, yeah. <laughs> I was calling it Rigsby. <laughs> um, yeah, then the meet, this group of scientists meeting together, and one of the female scientists has got a jacket on the back of her armchair, uh, red, the red armchairs yeah, in the city. Yeah. And the jacket keeps disappearing, appearing and disappearing in the shot. Yeah. And what and people would say oh, that's just continuity error. But simultaneous to this going on, you've got this faint announcement over the intercom system saying uh, an announcement saying a blue lady's cashmere sweater has been found in the restroom. It can it be claimed can go to the manager's office. Mm. So it, it's like he purposely. It, so he didn't he, miss it. He wasn't being. He didn't know exactly. Yeah, he made he took the time to put this, um, you know, this <laughs> this announcement in there as well. Yeah. You know, so it's. Um, and I think that's the case with, you know, there are some real oddities in, in The Shining. I mean, you look at, there's a scene where uh, Wendy and uh, Danny are watching the television in, the, la in the, the one area, and there doesn't appear to be any mains lead power in the television. Uh, it's just sat there in the middle of the floor, and there's a, you know, it's, it's, there's a picture on it, they're watching something on the screen. Uh, hmm. But it doesn't, you can, you can look and look and look, and you won't find any uh, mains for, you know, power cord. And there's loads and little things like that, and, and people do say people who worked on it as well that there was an intentional maze, like like the Overlook maze, I suppose, which you, is interesting. Where you have that shot of Jack Torrance looking down upon, um, and Kubrick himself in publicity shots for the film is making it that that same shot looking down with the camera into the maze. It's almost like um, you, you're going to get lost in this, but but if you've got the clues, you can you can navigate the maze, sort of thing, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, I think everything's in there for a reason. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's just a yeah. case of working out what that reason is. Yeah, yeah. And I think we'll speculate about it for a long time to come. But hopefully, we'll, we'll, you know, there might come a point where we can start to make a bit more sense of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, here we are talking about all of this what, 17 years after Kubrick's death. Mm, mm. And um, people will be talking about it for many more years. And people are noticing things yeah. now that were missed all those decades ago. I mean, the Jay Widener theory, for instance, yeah, I think only, yeah. only yeah. came out after Stanley's death. So you've got to wonder whether Kubrick deliberately encoded all these great truths mm. and all this symbolism into his films, knowing that many of them would only be properly interpreted after he was gone. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly, there is one thing I would like to add to um, the, the notion. I mean, this is not to take anything away from Jay Widener because he's done a huge amount of detailed research on the subject. Um, but people overlook the fact that the, the, the first person to actually make the connection between, for example, the Apollo fakery and the connection to, to suggest the possibility of there being a connection between Kubrick and that was actually um, Bill Casing, 
1970, barely a year after the Apollo 11. Right. And Casing worked for Rocket Dime, which was a division of North American Aviation. Later, it was Rockwell International, I think, and that was between 1956 and 1963. You worked there, um, where the Apollo Saturn V rocket engines were built, incidentally. So. And he was the company's head of technical publications, but he did a huge amount of research into um, lunar uh, hoax, fakery, that sort of thing. And he'd started doing interviews from 1970 onwards. He'd written articles about it in, in newsletters and things like that. So, And he'd suggested it right from the get-go. And I think it was 75, I think, when he um, wrote his book, which the name escapes me. I think it was uh, We Never Went to the Moon, but no, it's... Yeah, it was. Never, we never went to the moon. America's $30 billion swindle. And it was first published in 1976. And I actually, um, cost me a fair bit of money, actually, but I actually got a first edition print of it um, because I'd, I'd, I'd been getting PDF versions of it on the internet because I wanted to sort of check the date of when this idea was first articulated. And, and I thought these, these, sometimes these PDFs have been hacked to bits and changed around and all that. So I, I dished up the money eventually and got the original 76 at first edition. And there it is in black and white, you know. So, mm. um, so that suggestion was there right from the beginning. I mean, again, like I say, that's not to take anything away from what Jay Wyden has done because he's done some amazing research on it. Sure. Um, but, it's been, but that's interesting because that predates um, The Shining, obviously. So, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, it puts a bit of a spin on it, so... So it all just leaves you wondering how many more secrets there might be to discover that nobody's mm. uncovered yet in, in yeah. Stanley's films. You know, maybe there's still things that nobody's yet interpreted. And, mm. Mm. you know, it's... Yeah, I think for, for however many people are looking at it and for however many people, how many times they watch it, I still find things new my, myself now. You know, I've watched them so many times, but I, and I do. I tend to watch them more now for research purposes than, but you can't help but sort of slip away into the narrative a little bit sometimes sure. when you're watching them, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's always, um, uh, as it can be a mark of one of two things, that could be a mark of something very, very bad or something very, very good, you know. It's, it's uh, getting lost in the narrative like that. But I think with Kubrick, it's definitely a positive thing. Um, and, and a lot of people have said that. I mean, it's like you say, said before, it's, there's, there's a huge interest now. And I think it says something about the fact that peop there, are, there is an active and organised attempt to really muddle up the whole Stanley Kubrick stuff, especially the moon stuff. Even now, we had that uh, fake interview with um, oh, yeah, the, the yeah. impersonator yeah. Yeah. Last, late last year, and we have, we've had... That did uh, a lot of damage to credible did, researchers. Absolutely, that yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, of course, there was the film Moonwalkers as well with... Um, Rupert Grint and Ron Perlman, as, uh, in our, I don't know if you're aware of that one. Uh, yeah. I don't think so, no. Yeah, no. yeah, it's... Um, I think it came out in 2015 it got general release this year but basically Ron Perlman plays a CIA agent in it they're going ahead with the moon missions but there's a concern that something may go wrong so they need to have some fake footage in place just in case it, it does go wrong so they hmm. send uh, Ron Perlman off to find Stanley Kubrick in the UK um, but when he gets there there's a bit of a cock up and he he meets this uh, mus uh, a band a, a musician um, sorry a manager for a band played by Rupert Grint and one of his mates has got this long, straggly black beard and bushy eyebrows and that, and passes him off as Stanley Kubrick, basically. And this mm. CIA chap gives him all this money, and they just go out on the razzle, you know, <laughs> to get all up the wall, the yeah. money and everything. That. And then, of course, at some point along the line, they do hatch, actually have to make this fake uh, footage, and they do. Um, but it, I don't say it's actually quite a good film, but it's certainly. It, it but you've got to wonder why these things, yeah. why these things come out. Yeah. You know, yeah. is it to timing, to throw absolutely. genuine yeah. researchers yeah. off the scent, or yeah. uh, to discredit anything they might say in the minds of the general public? Right. You know, and, and certainly that, this. Sorry. Go. Yeah, that interview with. Uh, supposedly Stanley Kubrick, right. he looked more like friggin' Harold Shipman, the bloody <laughs> mass-murdering doctor to me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think anybody who was uh, was suckered by that within five minutes of watching it, I think they uh, you know, they need to go away and learn the Kubrick a bit more because yeah. <laughs> I think it was a pretty giveaway straight off the bat. So. And you've yeah. got this fake story about Ringo Starr floating around as well where he's supposed yeah. to be yeah, admitting right, to the yeah. Paul McCartney replacement. Now, yeah, uh, yeah. people well, will be aware that I, <laughs> people will be aware that I've done a lot of uh, research into the idea that Paul McCartney was replaced and mm -hmm. I can actually absolutely go with it. So mm -hmm. then you've got to wonder why they bother making fake uh, yeah. news stories uh, like this one, which is quite blatantly, provably a hoax, yeah. uh, if if there's no foundation to the story that's, at all. That's, that's right, yeah, yeah. And interestingly, it kind of ties into Kubrick's life himself because there was a chap who wasn't, apparently he wasn't a very, very good impersonator, but Alan Conway, I think his name was, 
who tried to pass himself off as Kubrick and went round these nightclubs in London and was trying to get sort of free drinks and free deals out of people and stuff like that. And, and Kubrick got wind of it. And um, I think there's a film version of it now where John Malkovich plays the character of Alan Conway in it. I think there, I'm sure there's a film version of it. Right. Um, but Kubrick apparently was fascinated by this idea of a, of a doppelganger. He was really, really, really interested in it. And allegedly, Stanley, uh, uh, Christian Kubrick said, what, what the hell are you playing at? You know, it's this is frightening stuff. You know, why would you want to? You know, but no, he, he was really quite fascinated by it. He was so, yeah. you know, it's uh, maybe you yeah. knew about Paul McCartney. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, <laughs> one of them because I, I I tend to think that there probably were several. Of, uh, that's my own take on that, and I think there probably were several Paul McCartneys. But oh it's, God, uh, Paul, okay. personal opinion on that one. So. <laughs> yeah, well, what, one subject at a time, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right then, Carl. Well, it's been a fascinating chat today. I was pretty it's sure great, it would yeah. be. Yeah, and, I've really um, enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, you've really brought some stuff to the table. And thank you. Uh, thank you for some of these revelations. So is there anywhere online that people can find more of your work and uh, find out more about stuff that you've put out there? Yeah, certainly they can, yeah. Um, they can check out my blog, which is thetruthseekersguide.blogspot.co.uk or .com will work as well. Um, that's my main website where I publish my articles and that. I've also got a YouTube uh, page with um, a number of presentations I've done, but you can link, they're, they're linked up from the web, from the blog page as well. And also there's my book as well, um, Science Fiction and the Hidden Global Agenda, published by Lulu. We can get it from there, or you can actually get it through my blog as well. Um, I pretty much sell that at cost, I don't make an awful lot of money on that, but I'm actually just finished, uh, that was 2013 I published that version, but I've actually just finished a 2016 edition, which has added about another 400 pages to it, and I've actually, because there's so much of it, I've actually had to split it into two volumes, so take a look at that. So yeah. Okay, great. And can people reach out to you and correspond with you if they want to do that? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't currently post my email address on my uh, um, blog because uh, I was having some spam problems, but <laughs> if people want to, uh, I monitor my comments on my blog, so if anybody wants to contact me, they can leave a message in the uh, with their email contact details or whatever, in the comments box, and then I will delete that. I won't publish it. I will delete that afterwards, and then contact them personally. It seems to work. Um, another a number of people have got my contact details as well. Andrew Johnson, for example, is somebody who can get hold of me for you know. But um, until I get over the few little uh, trolling problems that I've been having lately with my website, uh, hmm. yeah. So okay, sure. All right. Thanks for being a part of things today. Thank then. you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, great. This is just for I'm picking up vibration. I'm